resolved. COVID vaccines should be mandated for all eligible Americans. And I would like to call on the very patient Ms. Mallow to be our first speaker in the affirmative. Thank you, Madam Chair. I speak in support tonight of COVID vaccine mandates. I am a physician. My opinions are my own. Last week, I received a text from a friend asking for help. Could I help her find a hospital bed for her father-in-law? He had what aren't us neurologists refer to as a cerebral hemorrhage, a bleed into his brain. It was unrelated to COVID, but because all the ICU beds were full in his region of Georgia, many with patients sick with COVID, he could not get the care he desperately needed. I reached out to multiple physician colleagues trying to arrange an admission for him. Now, I am a strong believer in personal freedoms, and I gave a great deal of thought tonight to what side of the debate I would speak on. But when I got that text, I knew I needed to speak out supporting vaccine mandates. That text hit home for me that COVID affects all of us. Vaccines have been proven to reduce COVID infections, including those serious ones resulting in hospitalizations. While hospitalizations are starting to decline in my state of Tennessee and other states in the South, other regions are not that lucky. Other regions of the country are struggling to find hospital beds tonight, not only for people sick with COVID, but with heart attacks, strokes, and other emergency conditions. We're about to hit flu season, which will likely worsen COVID cases and the need for hospital beds. Vaccine mandates work. In late July, when the first mandate for federal workers went into effect, 95 million eligible Americans were unvaccinated. Today, that number has been reduced to 67 million, cut by a third. Vaccines also reduce the chance for variants. The Delta variant is a great example of how we ended up with a variant that was far more contagious and serious than the original strain of COVID. The more people who are vaccinated, the smaller the chance a serious variant can take hold in a population. Vaccines are also cheap. For our healthcare system, $20 on average for a vaccine compared to monoclonal antibodies, which cost 100 times as much, and then those hugely expensive ICU stays, vaccines are free to the US population. Now, I also believe we must not demonize those who have not yet chosen to get the vaccine. I do not call them ignorant. I do not label them anti-vaxxers. Most are ordinary Americans who are trying to make sense of the messy science. And I'm curious what their concerns and questions are. For example, does COVID provide natural immunity? To whom and for how long? These are important questions and should not be discounted. And as physicians and scientists, we need to be able to say, I don't know, and modify our policies as new data become available. On balance, given what we know now, I believe we need to use every tool available to us to increase the rate of vaccination to stop the spread of this devastating disease, which has cost countless American lives and touched each of us. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Ms. Mallow. Uh, I'm looking for questions for Ms. Mallow. So raise your hand on Zoom so I can see you. Let's see. Uh, Mr. Carper, would you unmute and ask a question? Yes, Madam Chair. Um, I'm curious if uh, to the to the speaker, uh, Ms. Mallow, if um, there is a room for a partial uh, partial requirement where not all Americans who are eligible would be required, but maybe a gray area or middle road. So 
there, I think that should be considered. I mean, I think in any policy discussion, we need to look at all of the options. I do believe though, that given what we know at this time, it makes sense to try to have as, as many Americans who are safely able to get the vaccine as possible. I think we still need, for example, to look at medical exemptions because there are some people who are not necessarily able to get the vaccine safely due to allergies, due to other medically underlying conditions. Um, so as a physician, I would, I would emphasize that. I'm glad you brought that up. Thank you. And for a second and final question, Ms. Stiller, would you please unmute yourself? I was really, thank you for your speech. I was very impressed, especially at the end when you said um, the way you approached people who were skeptical is that you're, you asked them about their concerns and their questions. Um, that's something I need to really learn. My question about that is, I am so impressed by what you said. How do you keep yourself from so much anger at people who, as you said, by not getting vaccinated or helping transmit COVID? I mean, how do you work with keeping that anger inside and getting to a place that is so understanding and open to um, open to questioning. Well, I'm a Braver Angels moderator, so I use the skills that I teach. But but serious, I mean that is seriously. But I I try to be curious because when I understand when somebody disagrees with my position, and I really try to understand where they're coming from, I learn something in the process and it makes my arguments stronger and clearer and sometimes I even modify my my position so I think being curious to others is really important because uh, when I take that tack I'm not angry I become more of a student and more of a learner thank you so much Ms. Mallow that having been a speech in the affirmative, I'm looking for a docketed, a pre-scheduled speech in the negative. Ms. Evans, would you please join us? Thank you. Um, and thank you to Braver Angels for hosting a debate on this very important and very fraught topic, and also to the previous speaker. Um, I'm Risa Evans. I'm an attorney and a professor of legal skills. Um, I think COVID-19 vaccine mandates universal COVID-19 vaccine mandates are a bad idea and that the censorship and coercion and scape. Ms. Evans, your mute has come on. So if you would please. I'm sorry. There uh, you go, go for it. Okay, um, uh, that, that, the, that the censorship and coercion um, and scapegoating that surround them pose a far greater threat to humanity than does the disease of COVID-19 itself. Um, so in the next few minutes, I'll just scratch the surface of this very complex topic and argue that the cost of such mandates to society um, outweigh any possible benefits to public health. So first about the cost to society. Um, as a result of an expanding system of vaccine mandates, we are becoming a two-tiered society living in what is essentially a system of medical apartheid. Um, it's important to fully imagine what this means, not just right now, but in the months and years ahead. So let's just take a minute to do that. On the one hand are the minority of people who, for a variety of reasons, have not and will not comply with the mandates. If you fall into this category, you find yourself increasingly barred from your own life as the efforts to obtain your compliance lead to exclusion from key aspects of civil society, such as jobs, schools, public transportation, houses of worship, restaurants, entertainment venues, gyms, and the like. Um, and because government mandates are always backed by enforcement mechanisms, if the soft coercions don't work on you, there's always the possibility of force, whatever that might look like. So on the other hand are people who comply with the mandates, some under duress and some because vaccine, vaccination is the right choice for them as it is for many, many people. Um, if you fall into this category, society is open to you. You can access everything. Um, there's just one catch, and that is that your medical passport needs to be fully up to date. When it expires, it's time for another booster. Um, and until you get that booster, you no longer count as fully vaccinated. Um, and if you don't get it, and if you start to question the efficacy or safety or need for additional boosters, well, you're relegated to the ranks of the non-compliant with all that that entails. 
Now, you may say that however dystopic this vision, um, such a society is worth it because universal vaccine mandates are necessary to protect public health and to end the pandemic. Um, and in this point, I would strongly disagree. Um, like when many well-credentialed independent scientists and physicians around the globe, I believe there is no public health justification for universal vaccine mandates. And this is for a couple of reasons. First, they can't and won't lead to herd immunity as evidenced by Israel and other highly vaccinated countries that are still struggling with COVID. Only natural immunity will do this. Second, they don't protect the vulnerable because the vaccines do not reliably prevent transmission of, of SARS-CoV-2, and they in fact lead to a dangerous and false sense of security. And third, they are not necessary to keep hospitals from overflowing because for people who do contract COVID, there are early treatments that are available. Now, you may be thinking, who are you to make these assertions? You're not a doctor and you're not a scientist, and you're right, I'm not but you can fact check my assertions and I assure you they are grounded in extensive research and thought. And that brings me to the final point, which is that this is a subject on which critical um, thinking and independent thinking are absolutely vital. I think we all have a duty to ask probing questions when our personal health, our civil liberties and the very well-being and fabric of society itself are all at stake, even to ask questions of the official sources of information. And to those who say we need to leave the um, thinking to the experts, I say we ask lay jurors to reach million dollar verdicts in cases involving complex technical, medical and scientific information. Jurors can do it, we can do it, and we must do it. This kind of critical thinking is just too important to outsource. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Evans. I'm looking for questions for Ms. Evans from the jury of her peers arrayed in this room. Please raise your hand to ask a question. All right, uh, Ms. Duncan. Uh, good evening. Um, I just I wanted to ask um, uh, our speaker. Uh, I, I get. I thought I heard you saying that shared immunity can only be accomplished through people uh, having the disease and recovering from it, uh, as opposed to um, through vaccine. And I just wanted to understand uh, how that uh, how that works, what that's based on. So I do not feel competent to talk about the science. This is my conclusion after reading a bunch of stuff and a lot, a lot of people who know a lot more than me about sort of the way antibodies and T cells work and about the durability of the immunity that is provided when you encounter the live virus. And so the immunity develops you know, towards the, the live, the whole entire virus as opposed to just the spike protein. But I think that this is something, I mean, that I, I, I don't feel in sort of here and now equipped to, to answer in a way that I think would be fair to the complexity of the topic. And for a final question, uh, Mr. Duncan, if you would, I, I am wondering if I'm calling on two people from the same house or if it's coincidence, let's see. Yeah, um, I am a conservative and I am dumbfounded but by my fellow conservative who don't want to get vaccinated. Now, I appreciate uh, the speaker. Um, there is a problem with enforcement, this. Imagine that ultimately FBI will come to you in the middle of the night and arrest you that you don't want to vaccinate. After you don't find a job, you are just uh, thrown away uh, the borders of the society. So we have a big problem here, but on the other hand, there is a criminal side to it, right? Mr. Duncan, you are, you are, Mr. Duncan, you're setting up a longer question than I think you have time for. So I'm going to have to ask you to I am, telescope a, a little bit. A few more words, please. So there is a criminal uh, part of it that people who don't get vaccinated, um, they kill other people. They contaminate other people, right? So, uh, I mean, my wife is a doctor. So, uh, I mean, colleagues of her, nurses and other doctors died in the hospital because they had too many patients there and uh, nothing could be done. So I, I want to hear the opinion of, uh, of the speaker about what I said, thank you. Um, I think again, that this is, this is really where the independent research and critical thinking come in. I mean, 
I, um, based on the, the reading that I've done, the speakers and physicians and scientists that I've listened to, you know, my understanding is that vaccinated people contract SARS-CoV-2, they transmit it to other people, and that all the mitigation sorts of um, uh, procedures that we've used throughout the pandemic to mitigate spread um, are really just as important for vaccinated people as for unvaccinated people. So um, I don't think it's criminal. And I also think that if we start criminalizing, um, you know, contagious illness, and we start criminalizing um, people for, um, for passing contagious illnesses on to other people, then that is a very dark road to go down because there's lots of other illnesses that people spread and there's lots of other practices that people engage in that create risks to other people. So, you know, there's no reason we should stop at COVID if we go down that road. Thank you very much, Ms. Evans. With that, the speaker is thanked. I'll be moving on to another docketed speech in the negative, but I only have one more docketed speech per side. So if you're interested in speaking in the affirmative or negative the resolution, please make sure to message your whip. You can find your whip by looking at your own first name and then finding the person listed with an asterisk whose name uh, you fall in their zone. So if, for example, your name was Virginia, you would be messaging Gretchen, who is covering Q to Z. So send them a little update that you're interested in speaking and a sentence or two about what you'd like to say. But for right now, I'm going to move on to our final docketed speech in the affirmative, and then we'll have one more in the negative. Uh, Mr. Uh, Naragi Arani. Yeah, if I look up on the show, it's green. Ms. Brinko and family, please make sure you are muted. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, uh, for giving me the opportunity to speak tonight. I support the resolution that COVID vaccines should be mandated for all eligible Americans. While I fully agree with the idea put forth by many that COVID is not as serious or life-threatening a disease, um, such as other infectious diseases like smallpox, polio, measles, Ebola, typhoid fever, or plague, this disease is far more contagious than all of them, with the exception of measles and smallpox. This contagiousness and the resulting pressures it inevitably places on the healthcare system is one of the main reasons why vaccination is so important. While the three vaccines authorized for use in the United States and their, and their efficacy in preventing hospitalizations and deaths is in excess of 90%, it is not only, this is only part of the picture. Indeed, multiple real world efficacy studies conducted in the United States, the United Kingdom and Israel have demonstrated an eight to 16 fold reduction in the rates of COVID hospitalization and or deaths resultant from vaccination. Efficacy and safety of vaccines speak mainly to personal safety and personal protection. While critically important and necessary, the efficacy of these vaccines in preventing the vaccinated offers, in protecting the vaccinated offers an even more vital protection, namely safe and effective vaccines protect our society. By reducing the need for hospitalizations, they reduce the burden on the healthcare system that is placed on it by the spread of this highly contagious and in about 20% of unvaccinated individuals, life-threatening virus. Given that any and all societies can allocate just so much to their healthcare systems, the massive increase in healthcare utilization engendered by a virus with the infectiousness of SARS-CoV-2 and with a rate of long COVID in excess of 10%, 10% of all people who get COVID develop long COVID, possibly up to 30%. This has multiple second and third order effects as was beautifully laid out by our first speaker. Indeed, before the release of vaccines, horror stories such as ambulances trying to get heart attack patients to hospitals being forced to drive around Tokyo for six hours while being turned back by hospital after hospital due to their facilities being overwhelmed with patients suffering from COVID. I submit, Madam Chairwoman, that the single most important and vital function of any government is ensuring the safety of its citizens. Vaccines offer such safety. They do this in a massively cost-effective and scalable way. They do this far less intrusively than what happens to the relatively few who get COVID complications that require intubations. And please let us not forget that this entirely benign 
virus, that this, this relatively benign virus is now directly responsible for the deaths of almost 700,000 Americans, more than in any of our wars outside of the Civil War combined. Human societies function based upon trust. Trust is built upon the members of society accepting responsibilities that they have to the larger group. Responsibilities that are not always easy to bear and at times will subjugate personal rights for a greater good, namely the proper functioning of a social contract. We all accept without question our responsibilities when we get behind the wheel of a car or obey instructions with the police or accept rules of behavior at a sporting event. What is it about vaccines that allows us to believe that vaccine mandates are of less importance than those laws, especially given that almost three quarter of a million Americans have died from a contagious disease clearly contro controllable by vaccination and other measure measures. Further, and just as important, we know that the rates of COVID infections, hospitalizations, and deaths are far two to eight-fold higher for people of color. The main reason is that due to the structural inequalities in our society, those who do not get to have the luxury of working from home, attending Zoom and WebEx calls, but who deliver our food, pack our meat, deliver our packages, maintain our roads, keep our pl power plants running, etc., are disproportionately people of color. My sense of decency and fairness does not allow me to say to them, I won't wear a mask, I won't get a vaccine, and I have a right to put your life and, your, and the lives of your family in danger because I do not like the minor imposition that these proven precautions make in my daily life. The polio vaccine was welcomed by our entire country, as was the measles vaccine, the rubella vaccine, the smallpox vaccine, and many others. Which have, deter which have demonstrated over the course of well nigh a century and a half, their incredible ability to reduce death and suffering. All right, Mr. Naragi, uh, Naragi Arane, I would have asked you to hit your last sentence here. In summary, vaccines work. They prevent suffering and death and do indeed reduce infections. And they are no more an imposition on our rights than traffic laws. Thank you very much. All right, I would love to have questions for our speaker. Please raise your hand. And remember to put your hands down after each speaker finishes so that your hands are only up when you do want to ask a question. Uh, Mr. Kamara. Hi, Madam Speaker. So I once wanted to address that. Um, I want to address something. So I understand the point that was raised about the cost of living in a society, correct? There is a concept of independence and interdependence. And both of those concepts need to be balanced. But my question is, which one is more important, independence or interdependence? And at the cost of one, do you think you'll get the other one back if one is given up? My answer to that is, what is the cost of you driving? Are you, should I, or should we as a society allow you to drive in whatever manner you want without any concern for the laws that are there to protect the rest of us? And if that, if that simple thing is not an imposition, then why is this an imposition? How is this um, a reduction and a, a detriment to society when the other is not? And for a final question, Ms. Reynolds. Can you hear me? I can indeed. Okay. Um, speaking to this gentleman, um, there are definitely some dangers involved for some people to get the vaccine. It is not the same, in my opinion, as when you drive and are careful, you don't harm yourself either. But there have been people that have died because they got the vaccine. And I have spent my life since I was in my late teens trying to prevent people from getting sick. <laughs> so this is something that matters. And years ago, I was a firm believer in vaccination, but I've seen so much harm done. And with the COVID vaccine, it, it, we don't know enough and people can quarantine themselves. And there are other methods if you increase your vitamin D level. If you- Ms. Reynolds, before you give too many alternatives, build, build towards the question mark, if you would. Do what? Come, come to the end of the question, if you would. Oh, okay. So I, 
I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, so no worries. I just, you know, make sure for all speakers, uh, if you have a lot to say, it's probably a speech or alternatives to repose. If it's a specific question for the speaker, it's a question. So I, and I think you have one. So go for yeah, it. I, mean, I always have questions. <laughs> But I, I was put, have you considered the dangers to some people and the effect if someone who is coming down with it quarantines themselves or people at risk stay away from other people? So I think that's a reasonable question. And this is the answer, in my opinion. Um, everything that we do, every action that we take has costs and benefits. And we make these cost benefit analyses in our lives almost as a, as, a, as a measure, as a way of, of, li of living, as of life, right? So um, we know, we, we have data that specifically talks to how many people have actually been harmed by the COVID vaccine. The rate is less than one in five million. I can send you as many, as many reports and, and, and analyses as you'd like. Compare that with the rate of bad outcomes for people who get COVID, which is about one in 200. And by bad, bad outcomes, I mean hospitalization and incubation and worse. And so from that kind of a cost benefit analysis, the small risk that one takes by taking a vaccine that may, um, in most cases that there are uh, adverse reactions, may cause a very brief myocarditis, which is basically an inflammation of the heart, which can be caused by very many other things and the direct link to COVID vaccinations has not been as well established as the media would have you believe. I don't see why that is such a greater danger than to follow the medical advice of doctors and the way that these vaccines have been studied and approved. It is the very same thing as Tylenol. Everyone thinks that Tylenol is not a big deal and I should be able to take as much as I want. Tylenol causes quite a few deaths from people destroying their livers by taking a lot of Tylenol or taking it with, with alcohol. But we accept Tylenol because it is a miracle drug. And I submit that vaccines are also miracle drugs, although far cheaper and far more effective. Thank you so much, Mr. Naragi Arani. And now for our next speaker in the negative, I would like to call on Mr. Karp. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Madam Chair. So friends, the essence of the argument that I would like to make this evening is that the problem with vaccine mandates and vaccine passports of all kinds is that they, they place the principle of public health above the principle of individual freedom, or what I call pluralism. Essentially, there are certain aspects of our society and of our lives that have always been considered to be beyond the pale of lawmaking, of governmental interference and intervention. For example, I suspect that most people on this call would not be comfortable with government laws or regulations that would seek to influence, for example, how we each understand the nature of the universe or whether we choose to worship something greater than ourselves or not or what books we read, or what movies we watch, or music we listen to, what we eat, what we, whether we exercise or not, what friends we choose, not to mention who we marry and with whom and how we choose to have sexual relations. These are aspects of our lives and of our society that historically have been considered to be part, you could say, of the sacred wellspring of our individuality. And as a society, we have fostered a diversity, you could say a biodiversity of approaches and beliefs and lifestyles that can coexist along with one another. Now, my argument to you tonight is that our health care choices, our choice of doctors, our choice of medical or health modalities, our choice of medicines, a choice of substances that we allow into our bodies are part of this sacred expression of our individuality and should be subject to no governmental coercion or lawmaking whatsoever. Just consider, for example, 
what could happen in our society if we continue to place the principle of public health. Mind you, public health is determined by some individuals, some institutions, perhaps by a particular political party, above the principle of individual freedoms. What could happen? Well, I ask you to consider the following. Many more people in our society die each year from heart disease, from obesity, from diabetes. Why not have a government mandated diet? Why not a government mandated exercise regime? Think of the thousands of lives that would be saved. Why should we not submit to that? Likewise, some of you mentioned traffic laws. Well, why not a government mandated driving software that we would all have to submit to that would determine where we can drive, when we can drive, that would monitor our driving practices? Think of the thousands of traffic deaths that could be avoided if we all submitted to a government mandated driving software. I could go on and on, example after example, if we continue down the path of placing one person, one group, one institution ideas of health, public health, above the basic principle of individual freedom, pluralism, I suggest to you we will undermine not only the healthy social fabric of our society, we will create a subclass of individuals who've lost their rights, criminalized individuals for holding different beliefs about the nature of reality, the nature of health, but I would submit to you that we will not create greater health in our society either. We will not create greater mental health. Rather, we will also undermine those dimensions of our society as well. Our health choices are as individual as our choice of religion. They're as important as our choice of marriage partner. They need to be utterly respected, in my opinion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Karp. I'd like to see questions for Mr. Karp. Hands up. Uh, let's see. Ms. Lane. Thank you, Madam uh, Chairperson. Um, I don't know if I said that right. Uh, thank you for the passionate uh, speaker that just went. My question to that speaker is, can you think of an example of any case where uh, you believe that the, the collective well-being is more important than the individual freedom? Yes, I could, ima I could imagine such circumstances. Um, but I can tell you, as our previous speaker even acknowledged, the risk of illness and death from COVID-19 is, is not significant. It is not warrant what's taking place. I believe we're living in an environment of national hysteria, quite honestly, created by media outlets and by unscrupulous drug companies who, who, who stand to benefit significantly from this national hysteria taking place. I don't believe the facts warrant the giving up of individual rights for the sake of public health in this case. And for a final question for Mr. Karp, Mr. Uh, End or Ende, I'm not sure which. Just make sure you unmute. We can't hear you. Uh, I've sent you an ask to unmute invitation. Are you able to accept otherwise? There we go. So um, I'm a primary care physician in Petersburg, Virginia, just to give you my background. And I've treated uh, hundreds of patients of my patients who have had COVID. So I'm pretty familiar with what happens with the patients. Um, in view of the Supreme Court decision uh, around 1904 concerning the smallpox vaccine mandate, uh, and the person who wrote the majority opinion stated that the individual freedom is not more important than the responsibility to society. And that 
you uh, the individual um, cannot uh, exclude his responsibility to protect other people from the disease. Uh, and as we've seen in Idaho and in Alaska, where the healthcare systems were completely overwhelmed by unvaccinated people, how do you justify your opinion that the individual's freedom is more important than his responsibility to society? The, the problem with your argument, as I see it, is that you're naively accepting that modern science and that our drug companies and that our government have our best ends in mind and that the facts as you read them are all simple and clear and straightforward. I will just say that I have worked in the sustainable agriculture movement for the last 30 years. And I'm quite aware of the demise of rural community, the loss of topsoil, the pollution of our water and air. Over the last 75 years in this country, our landscape has been toxified. Our food has been devitalized. Why? Because big science, big technology, big business, big universities have driven an agenda in, in the rural America to drive small farmers to become big farmers, to take away the biodiversity of our crops and fields and drive toward monoculture. My good friend, I believe that you're accept a viewpoint that actually is driving us toward the devitalization of our immune systems, toward the bifurcation of our society into a class who's willing to be vaccinated and has all the rights and a class that questions that agenda. I All apologize. Right, Mr. Karp, I'm going to have to ask okay. you to wrap up because there's an awful lot to say about agriculture and I'm very interested, <laughs> but I have to wait for another debate. I apologize. I just wanted to make an analogy here that I do think is relevant. Thank you so much, Mr. Karp. All right, I'm going to move on to a speech in the affirmative, but as a brief announcement for I do, I want to give uh, one announcement and one reminder. Don't forget that when you're posing a question to pose it to me as Madam Chair, and when you're answering a question, please answer it, you know, saying what the questioner, what, you know, um, you know, just to just to make sure that we're always addressing each other's ideas. And I expect I'll give the reminder more than once before the end of the debate, but I do want to remind people as we go. Also, a bunch of you have very interesting content in your questions that I suspect would breathe more comfortably were it in the full space of speeches. So remember to contact your whip if you'd like to give a speech. We're now going to move to three minute speeches followed by two questions each. And I invite everyone to kind of mold the balance of individual liberty and the common good as you try and make your questions as short and to the point as possible so that more of your fellow attendees can ask and answer questions. All that having been said, I would like to see a speech in the affirmative. Please raise your hands and make sure to contact WIPS as you go. Uh, all right, do I see Ms. Botwinick? Yes, hi. Th thank you, Madam Speaker, for allowing me to speak. Uh, I. Um, I approve the resolution that vaccines should be mandated. And I'd like to tell a story. Uh, I have a neighbor on my floor who is fully vaccinated with Pfizer. And uh, maybe a month or two ago, he uh, went to a dinner party with six other people and they were all vaccinated. And someone must have had the Delta variant and he caught the Delta variant. Six other people did as well but he did not have to be hospitalized. He had fever for 16 days, um, but he stayed home and now he's okay. So vaccines do work. I mean, he's on my floor. I didn't know it. I bumped into him at the incinerator. So I'm, I'm, even though he's okay, I'm a little afraid. I mean, I'm, I'm vaccinated. I had uh, Moderna and just today they came out, you know, you can get a booster, but I've had my antibodies checked and they're still high but I'm going to Florida in December, so I'm a little bit nervous. I, I live in New York City. 
So I'm, I'm going to ask my doctors, you know, professional people, I'm not a doctor, what I should do. Um, so vaccines do work. And well, it's, I think it's been 19 months so far. And I want this pandemic to end. I want to get back to my life. I'm gradually doing that. Uh, New York City is uh, reopening and we have to show our, our vaccination cards, which is fine with me. I do not mind. And when I'm going away, they ask for my vaccination card. And when we have to go to meetings, uh, we have to wear our masks. That's fine with me because I don't want to get sick. So I'm, I'm in favor of it. And vaccines do work. That's the point I want to make. And I want this to end. I want I want to get back to life. I haven't had a vacation in two years since December 2019. <laughs> and I'm still afraid to go out there, but I'm slowly and surely doing that. I'm sure, all, I'm sure all of us want this to end, to get back to life and for our economy to get back. So many stores in New York are, are closed. It's very sad. Thank you so much, Ms. Botwinick. Uh, may I have hands up for questions for Ms. Botwinick? Uh, it looks like Mr. Gardner. Yes, Madam Chair, can you hear me? I can indeed. Yes, I'd like to ask the speaker, she said that um, vaccines work, yet she gave an example of a vaccinated person that got not only got COVID, but had it for 16 days, apparently. And I think that is is mixing definitions of work. You're, you're saying, get this vaccine, it's, it gives you immunity. No, it, it, it'll just lower the consequences if you get it. So I, I think the speaker needs to justify why they're saying vaccines work, but it doesn't actually work. They're lowering the definition of what works to justify the mandate, in my opinion. My definition of working is um, not having to go to the hospital, not dying, and not overburdening the healthcare system. The, the man who talked about that, I thought that was a very valid point. And Madam Chair, until I'm recently, sorry, I'm sorry, we do uh, not have the space sorry. for follow up questions. You know, whatever you. level of efficacy uh, people believe vaccines have, I have a very high degree of ability to block follow ups, however interesting. So I will move on to a second question. And that will be from Casey Varga. Hi, everyone. I'm, I'm curious whether the speaker has considered that um, getting back to normal could very well mean the demise of the human species. Um, in my experience, we have a tremendous amount that we could learn from, from this disease. And there's quite a bit that we could consider about how we treat our bodies, how we treat our planet. And you know, my fundamental concern is that we aren't learning the lessons that we need to learn as a species so that we can continue to exist on this planet. Thank you. What do you mean? Oh, no. okay. oh, I, I believe Ms. Botwinick to offer a clarification. It sounds like uh, that you in your speech kind of address whether we might have the hope for returning to normal. And Ms. Varga would like uh, to hear whether normal is a desirable state to return to or if we have to do something different. Yes, I think we do have to do something different. I mean, normal is going to be different now. I mean, what is normal? That's, that's the question I think we all have to answer. All right. It's a, it's a heavy question. I'd love to hear other speakers return to it. But for now, Ms. Botwinick, thank you so much for your speech. I'd like to move on to a speech in the negative. Uh, may I have hands down for questions and hands up for speeches? All right. Uh, Ms. Weyrick, or please correct me if I'm pronouncing it wrong as you come on. No worries, it's Weyrick. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I'm not going to take super long. Um, my main thing is to point out that I do not believe that the vaccine is as safe and effective as they claim that it is. The reason behind that is that there was a group of doctors that went to the steps of the Supreme Court last year 
and they tried to disclose to the American people um, viable treatment options for the vaccine, and they were immediately shut down. They were called quacks, they were defamed, they lost their licenses, it was awful. The second thing that I would like to point out is there is something that we have in this country called VAERS, and it's actually, I believe it's worldwide, um, both in the US and outside. And VAERS is a vaccine adverse event reporting system. And a Harvard study was done over 10 years ago saying that VAERS only accounts for one to 10% of the actual adverse reactions to a vaccine. If you look up openvares.com, you will see that so far this year, there have been over 16,000 deaths just since the vaccine rolled out in January. That has only been 10 months with 16,000 deaths reported. And again, I remind you, that's only one to 10% of the actual number of deaths that would be associated with the vaccine. I would also like to point out that there are many people who now have chronic illnesses. There are people with lupus now that never had lupus. There are people now with chronic fibromyalgia, which I am actually a recovering fibromyalgia patient. And I was able to do it naturally, not through a vaccine. A vaccine is not gonna cure us. A vaccine is not gonna protect us. And I am very strongly against mandating any vaccine for any person anywhere on the planet. So that's where I would like to end it. And that's my opinion. Thank you. Thank you so much. Questions for our speaker, if you would. Hands up in the Zoom buttons. Let's see. Uh, I see Cheryl. Yes. Um, I was wondering, um, Madam Speaker, that since the speaker is familiar with the um, VAERS statistics, if she's also familiar with the reporting on the CDC website, which as she may know, does not just report COVID incidents alone, it reports COVID under the heading of PIC, pneumonia, influenza, and COVID. And when the statistics are broken out, um, they report the number of deaths involving pneumonia as 632,195. This was as of mid last week. And the number of deaths involving COVID and pneumonia as 300,555, 300, 298. So it's, it's about half of the deaths um, that actually involve COVID that's being reported, 355,000 versus the 700,000 that we see in the news that are reported, which also include pneumonia. I'm wondering if she's also seeing the same sorts of discrepancies on the CDC website. Thank you so much for that um, question and information. Um, I did try to bring that up with some of my coworkers today. Um, I do know some of the discrepancies, how the influenza just kind of disappeared last year. And again, also with the PCR test, not having the ability to distinguish between COVID or influenza. So I do appreciate that question. And yes, I am aware of it. Thank you. And for a final question, uh, I have a Jay Owens. Yes, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, my question for the speaker would be, um, because people are not considered fully vaccinated until two weeks after, uh, they receive both of uh, the Pfizer shots. Um, what happens if someone has an adverse reaction within those two weeks, but then the company would say, uh, it's not due to COVID vaccine because you're not fully vaccinated yet? What would be your opinion on that? My opinion is that that is fraud and neglect on the part of the person that would decide that it is not vaccine related. It is required by law to report within a certain time frame of receiving a vaccine um, to report the adverse reaction to it. Um, so I know a lot of people where I work in a hospital as well. 
um, and we were having issues that patients coming in were being labeled as unvaccinated going up to the ICU, even though they had actually received either one or their second shot, but had not completed the 14 days after the second shot. And I don't feel like the numbers are accurate. And I don't believe that the, our government or our agencies are telling us the correct information. Thank right. you. And with that, the speaker is thanked. That having been a speech in the negative, I'm looking for speeches in the affirmative. So I'd like the question hands to go down and the speaker hands to go up. All right. And I see uh, uh, Tiber K. Hi, thank you, Madam Speaker. No, my name is Tibor, I appreciate everyone's uh, nicely communicated thoughts this evening. I apologize for my informality of not even planning to say anything, but since there is some space, I thought you know these are really good conversations we're having. Um, and I think we all obviously really care about this and I hope care about each other. That's why we're here, especially in this format, in Braver Angels. Um, I think the couple of points I'll speak of really is just as a citizen. I will mention because many of us have in terms of my background, I'm a physician, um, but that doesn't mean I'm an expert in immunology and I don't claim to be in COVID, but I have seen many of the things that other healthcare workers have commented on. I think two or three brief points to touch on. For those concerned about the concept of legality, really important, you know, what precedent do we have when we're making things like these mandates? And as one or two other speakers mentioned, just to reiterate, we do have legal precedent for vaccines. Typically they're applied to select populations when those populations are at risk or if they are at risk of transmitting infection. So it's healthcare workers, restaurant workers, certain people that act to have the job are required for the vaccine. COVID-19 is a special and new type of infection in terms of its transmissibility. It's fair for us to look at it a bit more broadly. But again, to say that this is the first time there are vaccine mandates would really not be an accurate statement historically. Um, also good to just pause and say what's different about COVID versus other vaccines that I suspect many of you all have gotten as children and as adults and why all of the concern here. I don't have time, none of us do to be curious um, to all of us in breadth, but certainly one-on-one, -on -one, good questions to think about and ask. Um, to, in terms of vaccine efficacy, a great question to ask, but I think uh, a thing to remember is there's no medicine I've ever given or any doctor that's 100% effective, no vaccine that's 100% effective. Um, one of the speakers brought up the term, I think if I'm hopefully not too uh, inaccurate in paraphrasing, that the vaccine's not reliable. I think it's really important to remember we respect and uh, trust a lot of things in our daily life that aren't perfect but are reliable actually. For example, uh, Seatbelts are reliable, but they don't guarantee that you will survive a car accident if you have one. But I think all of us understand if we're about to have a head-on collision at 50 miles an hour, you'd much rather be wearing a seatbelt, even if it's not perfect. And I would put that highly in the idea of vaccine as well. Um, and finally, again, information is so difficult to parse. I respect uh, our speaker tonight, or our, our Madam Speaker uh, and Chairwoman who helped to remember, remind us this is not the place to adjudicate facts. But I would ask all of us to think critically about where we're getting our information, why we're trusting what we trust. I think our last speaker made a comment that is her prerogative to say, but I think is quite striking if we say, I don't think anything the government or agencies is telling me is accurate. That's a pretty hard place to then go walk out and make decisions. It's a good thing to explore. I support critically thinking about it, but I think in the rest of our life, most of us operate with some amount of that trust. So finally, thank you for your attention and uh, I wish you all the best. Thank you very much. Questions for our speaker, please raise your hands. Let's see. I see uh, Ms. Scott. Uh, Ms. Scott, can you unmute to ask your question? Yes. Can you hear me now? Okay. Thank you so much for um, having this program and, and allowing everybody to ask their questions freely. And I'm glad that you're a doctor because I was hoping to be able to ask a doctor this question. What I'm wondering about is if someone's had coronavirus and um, is over it, they, they just got through it, everything's fine, then why wouldn't they be able to go in and get antibody tests? And if their antibody, their natural immune system has high antibodies, then get the same kind of card that vaccinated people, and I'm vaccinated, but I'm just wondering, if, if their systems already, I think that a lot of young people, this is, really bothers me, I think they're not getting vaccinated because they think they've had it. And they say, hey, I, I have the, 
the antibodies. So I'm not going to go get a, a vaccine. So I'm just wondering if it were possible for them to, if you see what I mean, if, if it was possible yeah. for them to have that, even if they had to go do it every three months. Um, I think I'm just wondering why that is. Yeah, excellent question. Obviously very nuanced in your thinking. Uh, antibodies are a key part of the immune system. As people have mentioned, I think on both the pro and con side though, uh, antibodies are not all either in the natural infection or in the vaccinated reaction. Um, I think it's, I would imagine that in time we'll be able to have some testing that would help to guide us in who and when to vaccinate. My understanding of the data at this point is we don't have that. And so while there's good intuition and some common sense in the, in the way that you're asking that question, my understanding of the data right now is out of 100 people who have had the, who have had the infection versus 100 people who had the infection and got vaccinated, that second group that got additionally vaccinated will end up having better outcomes if they're exposed to it. So again, I think we can shoot towards the goal you're, you're bringing up in the future with greater public health and research to be able to more finely tune vaccination. But right now in this day in 2021, I think vaccination, whether you had the prior infection or not, is what's going to, on aggregate, for the majority of a group of people, provide the best benefit. And for a final question, let's see, uh, Mr. Schneider. Mr. Schneider, make sure to unmute. Actually, the last uh, questioner asked my question. We seem to have glossed over early on the assertion that people who acquire natural immunity have much stronger protection than those who get the shot. And I, I'm glad uh, that uh, Mr. Tibor said, you know, that's let us know that that's not settled science. Um, I'm glad that I'm glad that. Uh, Excellent doing all here at Institute, uh, but I think the points we just don't know right now, and to gamble and say that that's adequate, I think is literally a gamble. You want to make that gamble, but if we're trying to make public health policy and wisely thoughtful legal bit mandates not on gambles, but on actual data such as we have now. Not what we might have in a year from now, but what we have now. I had polio when uh, I was five. And I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to right. cut you off here so we can move hey. to our next speaker, but. Uh, you might return to that in the possibility of a speech if you talk to your whip. Mm -hmm. This having been a speech in the affirmative, I'm going to move on to a speech in the negative. Um, all right, let's see. Uh, Ms. Ma, I see Tina Lu Ma. Lu Ma. Hello, I have to unmute myself. Can, can, can you all hear me? Whoop. I can, thank you. Yes, thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, speaking as someone who is un, who is vaccinated and also has a history of being hospitalized for chronic upper respiratory conditions that do put me at high risk, I believe that vaccine mandates don't work. The vaccines work, but the mandates don't. The messaging on the pandemic and the vaccines has been terrible from the beginning. That being said, should we strive to get as many people vaccinated as we can? Yes. Should we continue to try to convince our loved ones to get vaccinated? Absolutely. But the shaming and the blaming and the mandating is not the answer. It becomes less about actually helping others and their families and more about being right. Vaccine mandates erode trust, not only in our government, but in the vaccines themselves. Couple that with rampant misinformation and politicization, and it really starts to feel like all is lost. The majority of people who are vaccine hesitant aren't that anti-vaxxers. They're just people who need more hope and more answers and less fear and shame in order to make an informed decision. There has been very little said about individual risk tolerance and risk assessment. And this is still not being approached in a way that educates people and hears and validates their concern in an open and compassionate way. It has become do this or else you can't work or you're going to kill everyone or worse. No one is talking about natural immunity or even the fact that getting a single dose of the Pfizer or Moderna vaccine can bolster your defenses against the virus instead of endless humiliation and catastrophizing. People should be given the resources to navigate their concerns and make decisions based on their own risk assessment. I think I have more questions than answers here though. And I do have some questions for all of you. How do we depolarize the vaccine and this pandemic? How do we shift this from a controversy to an actual down-to-earth, honest conversation about personal responsibility and risk assessment that meets people at their fears and concerns instead of dismissing them? 
how do we talk about this in a way that actually makes sense and opens things up to getting more people vaccinated because they want to, not because they have to. I think the key to recognizing the issues with the messaging is, I think the key is to recognize the issues with the messaging and change the way we talk about the pandemic and vaccines. And it starts with people like you and me, speaking to people from where they are in this process of trying to figure this out and understand this and figuring out what to do. There's a really great YouTube podcast by a doctor named Zubin Damania, Z-Dog MD, and he gives some really refreshing perspective and insight on COVID and vaccines in a way that is genuine and informative. He will often admit that his perspective shifts as new information comes to light and never claims to have all the answers. It's also important to note that although he himself is very much pro-vaccine, he finds vaccine mandates to be problematic and counterintuitive. He doesn't shame folks who are still on the fence about vaccines and instead believes that these are people with legitimate concerns that just want to do what's best for them. Long story short, vaccines work, but ma mandates don't. And if there's anything I've learned about people in my experience, it's that mandate, mandating vaccines pretty much will do the exact opposite of its intended purpose. Thank you all for listening and thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Ma. Uh, questions for our speaker? I see Ms. Johnson. Uh, yes, Madam Speaker. Um, I'm simply going to address one aspect of the speaker's um, statement, which when she mentioned or stated, vaccine mandates do not work. A couple of things I would just like to ask her if she is aware of, if she's considered in that argument. One is um, there's a lot of accumulating data that the recent mandates, uh, particularly in New York City, they've come out with data that the vaccine rates have increased dramatically when people do comply with those. So I would argue that they do work and I wonder if she's aware of that data. And the second part is- I'm afraid there are only first parts to questions at this oh, stage, so any stage of the night, but okay. it was a good first part and I'd love to hear our speaker address it. You know, how do you, okay. how do you respond to the results of vaccine mandates in states and possible upticks in uptake? Okay, so a couple of things. Um, I, I'm only speaking from my own personal experience. I do know that vaccines work and I, I do live um, in the New York area. So I do know that in this area, at least the, the mandates have worked, but I am speaking um, based on, I do have a lot of loved ones and um, my, um, my, my uh, significant other is actually still unvaccinated and many people that we know are still unvaccinated. So that for me is proof that, I mean, I've, I'm still trying to navigate the, these conversations in a way that's not, you know, like pushing up against all of this because there's a lot of pushback that I'm facing and I'm just trying to, I guess this is my way of trying to understand like this perspective and that perspective, I do know that the um, mandates, at least in this area, they do work. But from my experience, um, because my significant other actually lives in the South, um, and there, I, I had a whole big story prepared. But I, in the interest of time, I just wanted to condense some, uh, some of my points. That's kind of why I didn't really get into that. I, I very much appreciate it, and I appreciate how well you have condensed them. Uh, for a final yeah. question, Mr. Naragi uh, Avrani. Well, my, my comment is, while I disagree with the premise of um, what Tina said about vaccine mandates not being useful or helpful, I cannot agree more with the, the way that she expressed her issue and the specific points that she made. Because of all the things that were said tonight, the most important is the fact that we do have to find some way to come together and figure out how to support each other in a much better way. And I think her comments were by far the best ones tonight. 
You have put me in a tricky position because that was very heartwarming, but also not a question. Uh, and I am torn about it. But uh, I do thank the gentleman for his comment. And I'll remind everyone at the end of the debate, we'll have a period for next steps where you can highlight things that help shift how you think about the debate or what you'll do afterwards. But for right now, I'd like to thank our speaker. And we're going to have one minute where you may voluntarily, it is not a mandate, choose to stretch or move around for a moment. Since we've been sitting for quite some time for this debate in one place. And then we are going to enter the final phase of our debate with two minute speeches and only one question for speech. And I will hold you to one question per speech. And if you have something very heartwarming and moving to say, I will ask you to hold it for next steps. All right. If everyone has stretched or exercised their personal freedom not to, despite my recommendation, I will now move on to a speech in the affirmative. Uh, Mr. Leoz. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I, I'll make this uh, quick as, as possible. First of all, I want to uh, thank the previous speaker and the previous commenter to that speech uh, that I absolutely agree that shaming and blaming do not work. And I thought President Biden's words in that regard were actually quite harmful. Uh, but it does look like vaccine mandates do work. And for those uh, who know me within Braver Angels, you know that I left an, uh, a career in the automotive industry to, to work at Braver Angels. And, and I want to give an example that was brought up by a previous speaker uh, about seatbelts. We have seatbelt laws, not just to protect the immediate occupants of the car, but everyone who rides in a car in general, because cars need to be designed to the lowest common denominator. And so the fewer people who wear seatbelts, the more cars need to be engineered to account for that and are uh, heavier, more expensive, and actually less safe because of that. So there is a community impact for people not wearing their seatbelts, even though they think it just affects them, right? And so people talk about freedom as a reason that we shouldn't have mandates, but I'm a strong believer that the freedoms that we have in this country, uh, you know, that they, yes, they are very much an advantage that allows us to lead the world, but personal freedom requires personal responsibility. And we seem to have given up the willingness to sacrifice for one another, even the most minor inconveniences, right? But seatbelt laws, as an example, give us, they support our ability to move around the country freely. They support our freedom directly, right? They also provide car makers some regulatory certainty so they can operate in a, a more uh, level playing field in a certain environment. And this is the kind of thing that businesses need. Restaurants, uh, frontline workers, you know, uh, uh, flight attendants, uh, restaurant hosts, these people need government support to say, look, this is not me personally trying to make you do this thing, wear a mask or, or get vaccinated, but this is for public health and, and our public health leaders have told us that, that this is true. Um, and I know that there's a lot of complexity in terms of enforcement and backlash, but the pr core principle is sound. And a previous speaker said early treatments are, are widely available, uh, so we don't need this mandate. They're not really that widely available right? A lot of people can't get access to them uh, for one reason or another, which is bizarre, but our health system kind of works that way. And I think we need to account for that. And when I've asked people uh, who are against vaccine mandates, if it's okay that we have thousands of people dying per day, and if not, then what we should do as a public health response, I have never gotten a clear and concise response to that question. I'm very frustrated. And then my last point is about the VAERS system, which is why- I'm, I'm afraid- I'm okay. afraid there is not enough time for the last point, uh, okay. though possibly another speaker will take up the banner. I, I appreciate it, Madam Chair. All right, may I have questions for Mr. Leoz? Let's see. Uh, Ms. Kint. Hi, uh, Madam Chair. I would like to ask the speaker, he said something talking about our um, freedoms and then personal responsibility. And I would like to ask the speaker why, what has been the shift or what does he think is the cause that we want our freedom, but we want to ignore our personal responsibility? Thank you. Yeah, I think that's an excellent question. Uh, I thank the speaker for it. Um, I, I, I don't know the answer to that, uh, but it seems like we've been, been on a straight line dec decline of, of collective responsibility. You know, we have uh, the World War II, yeah, World War II generation, which is called the greatest generation because they made collective sacrifice uh, to protect our freedom and to protect our ability to live life in the way that, uh, that we had uh, been accustomed to, but also, you know, making sacrifices that, that 
that enable that way of life. And for some reason, the smallest sacrifice, whether it be clicking your seatbelt, putting on a mask, anything like that, I, I, I really don't understand why those small sacrifices uh, of, of personal freedom uh, don't add up in people's minds to the amazing, huge benefit that we would get in terms of overall freedom. So I, I, yes, I don't understand it, but I think we need to regain that sense of collective responsibility to one another. All right, thank you so much, Mr. Leoz. And I'm now looking for a speech, a two minute speech in the negative. Uh, let's see, uh, Jeremy Roth Kuschel. And again, please correct me as I call on you so that people are not too shaped by my pronunciation. Thank, thank you, Madam Speaker, very much. I appreciate it. And uh, I would like to um, resonate with all of the speakers before me in terms of the idea that we are all in this together, whether we like this or not. And I would also like to point out that I believe there's a false dichotomy that we can both sides of this debate can get caught in when we either try to sacrifice liberty uh, for the sake of security, in this case, public health, or I would assert the other way, that if we assert that we would sacrifice public health for security, neither way will get us where we need to go, which is where we can synergize our understanding and our intelligence around this rather than a both sides kind of situation. I would uh, point, make two references to two public health in intellectuals who I believe have key pieces of understanding here that we need to look towards. One is the uh, Harvard epidemiologist, Michael Mina, who just recently published an article in the New York Times called Rapid Tests Are the Answer to Living with COVID-19. That's obviously the situation in terms of, we know there are multiple breakthrough infections with the vaccines. And the collective responsibility that an individual has is to not just stay out of the hospital and overwhelm our healthcare workers in the system, but also to not infect others. So if there were to be certain mandates in certain circumstances, the wise uh, public health approach would be rapid antigen testing so that we make sure neither vaccinated nor uh, non-vaccinated are infecting others. The second quick uh, reference I would make is to the virologist Geert van der Bosch, where you can look his website up and he has written a public letter to the WHO titled Why Mass Vaccination Amidst a Pandemic Creates an Irrepressible Monster. And then a more recent uh, article titled The Keys to Unlock the Golden Gate of Herd Immunity Towards SARS-CoV-2, where he points out directly that if we go into mandating vaccination of the young people, of our children, we're not only going to uh, uh, deconstruct their more macro immune system, because remember, these are not macro uh, uh, vaccines. These are very micro and specific vaccines towards one specific spike, now legacy protein. And von, von der Boscher makes a very compelling case that I have not seen well debated by any other public health intellectuals that the mass vaccination is actually driving the, uh, the selective um, uh, evolutionary pressure on more virulent variants, which All is right. what we see exactly in terms of going from 1% Delta in the United States in the I'm beginning of the year to now 100%. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, may I have a question for our speaker? Mr. Bushka. Uh, Mr. Bushka, do you have a question? Are you able to unmute? Okay, yeah. Um, and I recently had surgery and in front of three doctors, we had a debate as to whether I needed to get the third shot. They disagreed. I finally had to use my own judgment and decided to get the third shot Pfizer and postpone the surgery a week, um, which my point being, I used my own judgment based on my own science. I read about this a lot. I did want to ask, you know, I did want to echo these form, the, the speakers point about the possibility of this is kind of an unusual vaccine. Maybe some people should take other kinds of vaccines like young men should take maybe the Johnson and Johnson. Um, I don't feel we know all the answers as to whether 
whether we should require everyone to do the same thing. Am I right in my read? So I think the freedom. Can you can you pose your question? What what is the question you would like our speaker to answer? Well, is there is there any more definitive answer than on the point you made about this is a very unusual immunity that might drive that might drive more virulent variants of the virus? I've seen that debated and on both sides by reputable people, including doctors. Is there any more specific information you have about that? This seems to like this is a real key point. Madam Speaker, I uh, very much appreciate the uh, questioner's inquiry. And I believe that there, because the, both the nature of this pandemic and the nature of the human immune system combine together for us to, ne it necessitates a complexity uh, and a nuance of thinking. Uh, and so I resonate very much with the, the questioner's uh, inquiry in terms of do we need to maybe be more focused and specific than these mass protocols? And I believe we definitely do. Um, I have seen, um, pre, uh, there's a preprint from Japan that talks about the SARS-CoV-2 Delta variant is poised to acquire complete resistance to vaccines that show that although the uh, antibodies uh, are working right now, that if we drive further pressure, it might actually uh, flip around and, and the virus uh, will be further activated in terms of one of its other pathways. And so in a certain way, because the, there is a mass approach to this, I believe that it potentially endangers people like you who very likely should be able to be insured that their double uh, uh, immunity plus the booster should survive longer than it being utilized by uh, maybe people who are younger uh, and just trying to get back to normal life or vacations rather than actually really considering public health in this matter. Thank you so much for your speech and for your answer. I'm now going to take what I suspect unless people ask very brief questions and give very brief answers, what I suspect will be the final affirmative speech of the evening. Uh, Ms. Stiller. Hi, um, thank you very, very much for um, asking me to speak. I'm speaking as a former teacher and school counselor and presently as a sub. So I'm speaking as an educator. Um, I will be upfront and say that I was one of the people in Oregon who advocated very, very firmly for keeping schools closed until we get all kids vaccinated. Um, I wanna point out that we require immunizations for a whole variety of things for public schools and even private schools in this country. We just require them I have not in my career ever really seen a lot of resistance. You just get your immunizations and you come. You immunize against COVID. To me, it's the same thing. We have a contagious disease here. You get your shot, you come to school without it. You're putting too many kids at risk. Um, we have young kids who still can't get their shots. We have even older kids who are still, can still transmit it. Who knows how many kids are transmitting it to other kids and bringing it home to vulnerable family members and then causing community spread. Family members who may not be able to get a shot, family members who are compromised. We are you know, encouraging community spread without those vaccines. Um, the other part of it, the very, very uneven application of safety protocols in the schools. We have very strong, very detailed protocols in Oregon very uneven application. We have kids going to school without masks and teachers in schools looking the other way. We need to have kids protected and vaccines are the way to do it. Um, I think the last thing I want to point out is if you've been reading the news, there's been a very, very big rise or at least, you know a rise in pediatric cases since schools have opened um, and we need to keep our kids safe. And the other, the last point I want to make is due to the contagious, you know, the contagiousness of this disease, and this has been pointed out by other people, this is very important. Flu, strep throat, car crashes are not as contagious or not contagious things. This is contagious, and it has a very much larger percentage of causing death and severe illness to people. So um, as an educator, I feel very strongly about vaccine mandates. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Stiller. I'd like to take a single question for Ms. Stiller. Let's see. Um, let's see. I'm looking to see if there are names I haven't seen yet. So if you've been waiting to speak, 
go for it. Uh, E.L. Ledet, please. Yes, Madam Speaker. <clears throat> um, to the speaker, there seems to be a equalization of this vaccine to previous vaccines. Uh, is that my is my understanding correct? I don't know about equalization. I'll, I think go ahead and ask the rest of your question, and then I'll have Ms. Stiller uh, address the nuances of it. Okay. I don't want you to use up your whole question on that part of it. You're, you're talking to me or to the speaker? I'm talking to you, Mr. Ledet. So there okay. won't be a follow up. So be careful about okay. ending your question there. Uh, assuming she thinks they're comfortable, where where is your question going next? The, the reason being is, is that the majority of vaccines in the past, and this was discussed by two or three other speakers, even though there's no 100% guarantee that it's going to prevent disease, my understanding as a biochemist is that vaccines in the past did prevent disease. This to me is a concern and that it is, it's, it's double talk. I don't believe it. That's all I have to say. All right, Ms. Stiller, uh, how, would you, how would you respond to whether these are? The question was that the vaccines are not going to prevent COVID 100%. They're not 100% effective. We knew that going in. Vaccines are not 100%. They prevent severe disease and they prevent hospitalizations. Every bit of research is going to show it. So no, it's not going to be like the polio vaccine in that it's going to eliminate it. You know, Maybe years from now it will. But it's going to prevent the severe death, the hospitalizations. And to me, that is way worth taking it, despite the breakthrough cases we have seen. Thank you so much, Ms. Stiller. That having been a speech in the affirmative, I would like to take a speech in the negative. Let's see, Mr. Kamara. Hi there, can everyone hear me? All right, so a couple of points I wanted to mention was that about this whole vaccine, the reason why I'm against the mandates is that number one, I feel that this vaccine was rushed. You know, I think the full FDA approval, it didn't, it took within a year or two years for it to just be passed through just to be approved from emergency use authorization. And the thing about this vaccine is that, from my understanding, it only provides symptom mitigation. It doesn't really provide any form of real immunity. So, because the difference between this vaccine and the polio vaccine is that people today, they don't get polio. They don't get a lessened version of polio. So that that's in this vaccine that just gives you a lesser version of COVID. So really, I think I believe that that defeats the purpose. But what I'm most concerned about is the increasingly authoritarian approach to securing these vaccine mandates. And I understand some points are raised about, yeah, I know we all want to go back to normal, right? This pandemic's been going on for long enough, but in the long run, things aren't just going to go back to normal if you just comply, you know, because the way I see it, if the government can take away your freedom and get them the freedom to move about freely and to give it back to you when you comply. Are you really free? That's something I want to bring. We're literally at the point where even in cities like New York City or Los Angeles, we're at the point of papers, please. You got to ask for papers to move freely. You got to ask for papers to go to certain places. And that's a characteristic of many authoritarian regimes in history. But if you have to be threatened, shamed, bribed, or coerced into doing something, chances are that may or may not be in our best interest. You know, like I think the, and especially with the people who have like, you know, beliefs about, or they under, they have their own positions regarding these instances like vaccine mandates. I think the more you push it, the more you mandate it, the more skeptical they become. So really at that point, if, if you have to do that, is it really worth it? You know, that, 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 that's my position. Thank you so much, Mr. Kamara. I'd like to take a single question for Mr. Kamara. Uh, let's see. Uh, Hello. Uh, I see B. Dixon. Yes. Yeah, thank you very much, Madam Chair. I would like to ask uh, Mr. Kamara, but it's actually a question that I wanted to ask to other presenters as well, but just didn't have an opportunity. If we now were faced with a sudden 
um, 700,000 people dying because of Ebola, would we react differently? Would we really want our, 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 our government and so to, to mandate uh, vaccination for that? I'm just wondering whether there is a, a sense of a, a different perception uh, between different diseases, so to speak. Thank mm. you. Okay. Well, I, I appreciate the speaker's question, but I think the position, so if I'm understanding her point correctly, if 700 um, people, if I might be misunderstanding this, but 700 people dying in, let's say, in a, in a matter 700,000, right? Oh, I'm sorry, not 700, my, my apologies. <laughs> yeah. 700,000 700, people, people dying. United All right, States. yes, go yeah. ahead, Mr. Kamara. So if I understand it, this is within the matter of two years or in like a shorter period of time with a different well, virus. Just like for COVID. Just I'm like afraid there can't be too much back and forth. So just Mr. Kamara, please okay. do your best so shot for question as you understand it. Yes. You got it. So... Really, with COVID, the 700,000 that have passed away from COVID, you have to take into consideration that a lot of these people might have had any, they might have been up in age, they might have had some underlying health condition that could have made them more likely to be hospitalized, because I even did the statistics myself and the research, and I live in Georgia. So doing the numbers from the Georgia Department of Public Health, eight 18 to 29 year olds have a 2% hospitalization rate and a 0.07% death rate. But of course, that number decreases as you get older and it further increases if you have uh, comorbidities. So really, I think the position that I will take with the 700 people that, that have passed away because of COVID, if you're elderly or immunocompromised, I would recommend you take the vaccine. That that's just me. Like I said, it's, it's your choice, bodily autonomy. But if you are younger, or if you're not in that position where you are likely to clog up a hospital bed if you get it, then I don't think it it should be mandated because it doesn't matter who's vaccinated or not. We clearly see that now, if you're vaccinated or unvaccinated, you can still catch and spread COVID to other people. All right. Thank you so much, Mr. Kamara. People having been admirably terse in questions and answers, I have time for two more speeches, one on each side. So I would love this time, I believe, as the final affirmative speech to call on uh, Mr. Emert. Hi, sorry, I thought we were done. <laughs> so. I did too for a moment, but I'm really happy to hear from to last people and thank you for moving back into a room with lights. <laughs> You're welcome. All right, so I am a science teacher. Um, so I do have some background in this. Um, so about herd immunity, you know, herd, vaccines can definitely make herd immunity. We've done it twice with both polio and um, smallpox. Those were pretty much entirely uh, artificially induced by vaccines. Maybe we don't get to full herd immunity with the vaccine, but still less people spreading it around, less chance for mutations because people are getting less infected. And there's also, uh, you know, less chance of people who are, you know, can get it and get sick drastically, you know, getting sick. Also, cultures throughout history have known that disease is a public health risk and it's okay to give up temporarily some freedoms for it. It dates back to Venice with the first quarantine laws, English common law um, that transferred over to American colonies. Heck, George Washington forced the vaccination of the United States Revolutionary Army because he knew that it was worth it. Um, the Supreme Court also noticed this in Massachusetts that was previously mentioned. Thing is, the courts have this thing where, you know, is it an immediate danger? You know, if yes, then you know the the government is allowed to do re re restrictions and regulations, but if not, like somebody mentioned, heart disease earlier, generally it gets shot down by the courts because that's what they're there for, uh, for doing um, constitutional stuff like that. Um, so, thing is, you know, herd immunity, like the the shield, only works as good as the amount of people that are in the shield. So you are protecting people from dying. 
your rights are limited because there are other people on the planet. The only time you have absolute freedom is when you're on an island in the middle of the ocean. So, so because of that, you know, you have to limit your freedoms through numerous things from wearing pants when you go outside to seat belts. So, um, you know, there are reasonable common sense restrictions on freedoms all the time. And I believe that this is one of them. Is my time up? Yes, thank you so much, Mr. Emert. I'll yeah. take a single question for Mr. Emert who has certainly illuminated the debate uh, very literally in coming back into this room. And then I'll leave it to the questioner <laughs> to decide beyond that, Ms. Rice. Uh, Ms. Rice, I saw your hand up. Are you able to unmute? Otherwise, I may move on. Let's see. I have a question, Madam Chair. Um, with regard to the vaccine mandate, and I wonder if the speaker feels that um, what we see are a lot of inconsistencies in the information that we read. And I, I think that one of the ones that troubles me a lot is um, the people who are not mandated to have this vaccine. And from what I've read, it includes the Afghan and border refugees, Congress, independent contractors, independent franchise employees, federal court system. I'm, I'm going to have to ask you not to list all the exceptions just doing to the nature of the hour, but please go forward on the question. Okay, do you think that part of the problem is the um, inconsistencies that we're receiving in information? Um, well, I mean, there are always gonna be inconsistencies due to math and statistics. You can analyze math in a whole bunch of different ways. And a big problem with like the exception stuff is the way that the, man the, the mandates are being enforced now. It's primarily through OSHA. And uh, OSHA can only affect, you know, the workplace environment and not to mention Congress. They're another branch of the government. The executive has no say uh, in Congress. Um, so we can't do anything about that. Um, and I think that's where a lot of those exceptions you get are coming from. Thank you so much, Mr. Emert. And now for a final speech, and this time for real, uh, in the <laughs> negative, let me see. Uh, Alona uh, C, are you still with us and ready to speak? Yeah, can you hear me? I can, thank you so much. Uh, I wasn't expecting to be called on. So um, so my bias is I'm, I'm in California. I, um, I lean left. I'm an ICU nurse in a city hospital and I've seen a lot of people die of COVID. Um, by the time they get to the ICU, most people die. That's just a fact. Um, so we had this vaccine mandate come through our workplace just in the last month. No more biweekly testing. Everybody's gotta be vaccinated or not come to work. And um, we had this one nurse who's not from the state, does not um, agree with the prevailing politics around here. He got COVID right around the time that a lot of us were getting vaccinated, full on COVID, didn't end up in the hospital, strong guy. And um, he also is an ordained minister and really does not want the vaccine. So, when the mandate came around, he applied for an exemption. In his case, the only one that's recognized in the state is a religious exemption. He, he feels like he's immune. I realize the science isn't there, but um, he got tested, antibodies, all that. And um, he applied for a religious exemption and then went down south to take care of his mom and his brother for a while, which is where he is now. Um, he got his religious exemption, but he's not sure he wants to come back because he feels like he's been judged, because he feels like what he felt like 
was a team effort on his part, was not necessarily a team effort on the parts of some of our team members. And we may have lost a very good nurse because of the judgment that goes around. And that has been boosted by the mandate, by people feeling like, oh, we're justified now in our judgment of people who don't wanna get vaccinated for one reason or another. And um, that's, that's a shame. Thank you. Thank you so much. May I have a final question for our final speaker? Uh, Mr. Weston. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, uh, and all the participants. And thank you, thanks to uh, the uh, uh, Braver Angels for making this possible. My uh, short question, uh, kind of a two-part. Uh, we have the choice. A, a one-part question. If okay, you we have the choice of going to a hospital and what treatments are applied. So I, I, I guess my main question is. Do we have a choice of what treatments are applied? I, I, I do believe we have the choice of going to a hospital or not. Thank you. I don't actually know how much choice people have of what treatments are applied or what's available through any given hospital system. The hospitals go with formularies, for example, and they're kind of stuck with those drugs. Um, if you don't want a treatment, certainly you can always say, I don't want that, and people do. Um, if you don't want to get intubated, we are very ready to help you be comfortable and allow you a natural death. But you have to say that before you're oxygen deprived and you know, kind of passing out because then your brain's not working well and so we can't really take your word for it. So you got to plan ahead for those kind of contingencies. I'm not sure I understand the question, but yeah, you have it. You have a choice when you, even after you go to the hospital of whether you get treated or not, which treatments I'm, I'm not so sure how much choice there is. Thank you so much for your speech and for your response. And that brings us to the end of our formal debate. So we have a few last things. Um, I'm going to ask for a motion to adjourn since this is our final speaker. Uh, let's see, do I see uh, a motion to adjourn? Uh, one from moved. uh so moved do i hear a second? second second all right we are now adjourned from the formal part of the debate i would love for the chat to be opened gretchen so that i'd love to take a few moments to hear people's reflections both in the chat and briefly if you put your hands up um so very brief like 30 seconds which is two sentences to be clear and that's without any semicolons of anything that shifted how you thought or anything you're planning to do differently after this debate. Uh, let's see. Uh, Susan DeGaia, if you would. Oh, thank you. Well, that was unexpected. Oh, okay, two, sec two sentences. Um, I did have a shift in my thinking, which is that I think the mandates are necessary. So I'm a little more stringent on that but i also believe there should be some exceptions and thank you to everyone thank you susan all right uh luke grossmiller if you'd like to unmute for a moment the new perspective for me was that it seems like there's a lot of like uh disagreement about when is the the proper time to employ a mandate rather than if a mandate ought to be employed or not like black and white that people fall on the spectrum, if that makes sense. Thank you so much. I think you know a lot more discussion of edge cases where people could find some common ground than folks may have expected. Uh, Roxana Dean. I don't think, I didn't change my opinion about the the necessity necessarily of mandates, but I did resonate with the words about hysteria and trusting the pharmaceutical companies. I realized that in my life, I usually don't like big pharma. And so now I 
maybe have to rethink their position in all of this. Bill Richardson. Yeah, the one thing I wish they would have discussed more is natural immunity, immunity uh, after you've got COVID. And I think that was one thing that the mandate shouldn't allow that if you've already proven that you've got COVID and you've got natural immunity that you shouldn't have to have more shots. Uh, there's medical discussions on that. So that's, uh, I, I guess, uh, I'd more like more information about that. Uh, let's see. Uh, Ingrid Noise, I see your hand is up. Thank you. I am just as um, my concern, I'm vaccinated. I think everybody should be that can be, but I'm concerned about um, mandating it. I, I'm just concerned about what will happen if there's a national mandate. I'm concerned that too many people are too violently opposed to it and that it's not a good plan to do that, but that um, but that leaves me in a position. But I do think that businesses and hospitals and schools and government agencies should be able to mandate whatever they feel they need to mandate for their own employees, clientele, and to keep their people safe. And that varies, of course, we're already seeing that varies from school to school and community to community. Um, Thank you. As a business owner who's business <laughs> I'm done. Okay. I, I think so, but I appreciated what I heard. I want, I see a bunch of hands up, so I'd like to get to as many as I responsibly can. Uh, Lou Lieb. <clears throat> I'm a little frustrated because I, I think the, the biggest question mark here is to what extent unvaccinated people spread the disease more than vaccinated people. And I don't feel that we've adequately addressed that subject tonight. Thank you. I appreciate folks giving us two hours of the night. And I can tell you, I have some things I wish, you know, I'd gotten to hear more about, but I really do appreciate everyone setting aside two hours of your evening to explore what the parts we could in the time we had. Uh, Jeremy Walker, would you give us your comment, please? I really resonated with what the second speaker in the negative said about um, the dangerous of naively trusting um, the, the mandate, what's behind the mandate and the science and the based reasoning. And I really would have loved to see that point be incorporated more into some of the other um, speeches and questions in the positive, because I, I hear most of the, the arguments for the mandate basing on that assumption and I didn't really hear it adequately addressed. All right, thank you all so much. I wish I could call on more of you, but again, I appreciate how much of your evening you've given to each other tonight. And you know, how much of your evening, we're going to close the chat and ask you know, a little bit for just you to open the link for our evaluation of the debate to help us improve debates uh, and plan for future debates, even suggest topics for future debates. But I really want to say how much I appreciate people setting aside two hours of their week on a work night to come and hear each other out. I think all our debates touch on important questions, which means they touch on questions that can really get our dander up. And I think this debate more than most is one that can be difficult to hear people out when you think you hear people saying things that are wrong that could change the way people live for the worst. So I appreciate you spending the time tonight to do that and to try and reach each other, hear each other out, and ask honest questions that you're genuinely curious about the answer. We hold uh, frequent debates with Braver Angels. We have another debate coming up soon this month. But I'd like to introduce Jamie, one of our volunteer whips, just to talk a little bit about the scope of what Braver Angels does in case you'd like to get involved or sign up for another event. So Jamie, would you join us, please? Helps to unmute. All right, can you hear me okay? Very well. All right. So um, you mentioned the debate. Our next uh, national debate is coming up in two weeks on October 28th at 8 p.m. same time, uh, 5 p.m. Pacific, uh, Pacific time. 
and the topic is going to be resolved, America should stop nation building. This is a Coliseum type debate with a smaller panel. Attendees are able to pose questions and participate through polls and periods of open chat. Um, and I believe this information is now in the chat. Um, just wanted to say a little bit about uh, my experience of uh, volunteering for Braver Angels. I've been involved for going on three years now um, and got involved because I was very concerned about the level of polarization in our, in our country, uh, especially over the last, the last now five years. Um, and participating in debates uh, gives me something um, so that I feel like I'm doing something. Um, and it's also a great team. Um, I've, I've loved being part of the debate team and um, if that's something that you think would be interesting, um, you can start out as a whip um, and then um, do other roles as well. And I always I come away from every one of these debates knowing more about the topic that we've debated um, and um, given me food for thought. So, um, so we encourage you to support Brave Angels and you should see a, a link for membership in the chat. Um, and I've already told you about um, if you if you're interested in volunteering, it's a it's a great group of people that put these debates on, and um, and please uh, email us at the the link in the chat and check out our web page, and someone will contact you as soon as possible. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Jamie. And we really have a wide range of ways you can volunteer and help out. We have people working at the local level, meeting other folks in person. We have folks working behind the scenes like our excellent whips for tonight who are fielding dozens of Zoom messages and relaying things to me. So whether you feel very tech savvy or whether you want to spend a lot of time one on one talking to others, you know, there are a lot of ways to volunteer with Braver Angels because there are a lot of ways to care for our neighbor, especially the neighbors we find it hard to care for. And that's what makes me really happy about being here. I so appreciate the questions you brought, the speeches you brought, and I'd love to see more of you, not only at other debates, but you know, behind the scenes helping us run them. So I'd love to hear from you there. And whether you have the time to volunteer, the money to contribute, no matter what, you can give us something very valuable, which is your feedback on this debate. So the link is in the chat telling us what worked for you, what didn't, what you'd like to see us tackle in the future. That's all very helpful to us when we look closely at the information you give us. Thank you so much for setting aside your evening to listen to arguments, to make your own, to practice patience, and to speak with compassion about an urgent matter.